as an homeostatic organ all right you can see that background picture of the head standing so we get to understand the significance of that before the end of this lecture now the skin is the largest um, organ in the mammalian body not even the mammalian body all vertebrates the skin covers the entire um, body as it were now it is covered in mammals with hair which varies amongst mammals now you can imagine the mammals i have on the screen you have wolf you have gazelle hyena then antelope or the likes so each of these that you have here leopard is them um i can't see the fourth one look i think a deer there now all of these um, six animals here are uh, have different um density of hair on their skin even humans we have hair on our skin it's not as much as they do and even amongst us it varies from person to person like myself i don't have beards and sideburns and the likes so it varies from people to people all right so the skin is in contact with the outside world that is true that's what we used to feel things around us and the likes so what are the layers of skin it's divided into two main layers which is the epidermis which is what are divided into conified um, granola and malpigian layer some books we call it um stratum cornisum stratum um, granul uh, granulum either way it means the same thing all right so um that's just other names for that now moving on dermis which is the one lower to the epidermis is um, thicker of course it um is the one overlaying another um, layer called them um, subcutaneous layer which has subcutaneous tissues which has some um, adipose tissue so we have it this way epidermis dermis then subcutaneous layer or scop that contains subcutaneous tissues all right when it says sub it means below cutaneous with skin all right so let's take them one after the other now the epidermis is made up of three main layers actually it's about five layers really when it's subdivided but um, we'll focus on the three main layers from the innermost to the innermost, we have MGC, which is Malpighian, Granola, and Cornified. All right. Now, Malpighian layer is the, this is the actively dividing layer. These cells here uh, help to replace the cell of the epidermis. Now, we said the innermost, that's the one with Malpighian, the innermost, Granola, Cornified. So, this is the one that helps to replace the cell for these other two above it. So, it contains... Um, what's it called? Um, a, a pigment called melanin. This is responsible for the what? Absorption of uh, ultraviolet rays, which helps give the, the color to the skin and the hair on our body. All right. So the extent to which you have melanin, the more you absorb UV ray, the more it depends the kind of skin you have, as well as the the, 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 the color of your of your skin. Sorry, of your hair. Now the granular layer is formed from mapigian layer, like, just like I told you. Mapigian layer is here, the next one is the granular layer. It contains living cells, of course, and these cells become flattened as they approach the surface of the skin. So it means that Mapigian layer will lead to the formation of the, what's it called, conified, sorry, granular layer, which is also a dividing cell, which came from another dividing cell, which is the Mapigian layer. So as this cell is being pushed forward, it becomes flattened and they become, they, they die gradually. So now, so it means as they approach the soil of the skin, that's the granular layer pushing towards, pushing itself upward, they become flattened. Now, that will end up forming the conified layer, which is formed from what? Granular layer. This contains flattened cells, which produces what? Keratin. Keratin produce, gives, um, produces, oh, sorry, keratin gives the waterproof ability of the skin. So it allows water. It allows us not to get um, soaked when we swim into when when we, I mean it prevents water from going in and out of our body like that. If not for that, maybe when we swim, we might actually absorb water like foam. Now, as the keratin increases, they become flattened. So as the keratin increases in each of these cells, they become flattened. At this stage, they end up dying. So what we expect is that the conified layer is majorly made up of dead cells that are keratinized. They have keratin in them. All right. Now, the thickness of this conified layer, which is keratin, that contains keratin, vary in thickness on oh, sorry, vary in thickness on different parts of the body, and is is very thick on the parts that's exposed to friction, like the palm, 
like some knuckles are joints. Those the palm and the of the of, of the and the sole of the feet have that being thicker. Now this layer can be modified to form nails. Well, that's wonderful. To form nails, as we have it here, to form um um what's it called? Feathers, claws, hooves, and horns. Now, something you need to take note of is if you put if you set any of this in on fire, you burn any of these ones, it smells just like the same way the hair smells. That means there is keratin in all of this, and there's keratin also in the hair. The hair of her body, yes. So the hair smells the same way the nail will smell, the same way the feather will smell, the same way all of this will smell because they came from the same structure and have the same pigment called keratin in them. So let's take a look at the skin in a minute. So you see that this is the epidermis, the three layer. You can see the, the SC is the conified one, the SG is the granular one, the SS is the mapigian. Now pay attention to SB, which is the um, stratum basement is one that separates the epidermis from the dermis. Now, I want to pay attention to something that, um, or uh, oh, sorry, I mean, SB is the Marpigian, please. SS is the basement. Now, pay attention to something now. The the structure that forms SB, which is Marpigian, that separates melanin, is the same thing that forms around the spatial gland that come around the air follicle, which we get to see that in. In dermis. So what you need to understand here is that, as a point, the dermis is the outer layer. The it secretes, um, sorry, codified layer and granular layer. That's where keratin is formed, but it's majorly seen in the codified layer, which is the outermost. All right. Then the mapigian layer secretes melanin. All right, and that melanin is what helps to absorb UV ray. So the next thing we went on to is the dermis, dermis, which is the thicker layer to the epidermis. So for examination purpose, we can pause the video here to practice this diagram, all right? Then dermis, this is much thicker layer and it is composed of connective tissue, blood capillaries. Now this blood capillary, which helps, which supplies nutrients to the skin and also releases waste product to the skin via sweat gland yes you get to see because this blood vessel capillary this is the the the, the, the sweat gland like this coily gland so the sweat the, the the blood capillary is close to it so when it's very close to it it will secrete its fluid within it release it into sweat gland sweat gland will release it by sweat duct you get to see that as we move on so it contains lymphatic vessels sensory cells now as even if I close my eyes, I touched myself, I felt it because I have what we call receptors that perceive different stimuli such as touch, pain, temperature, and pressure on our body. Every inch, even if I take a pain to touch my skin, the place where the pain is touching, as small as it is, has almost all of these receptors. Of course, what we need to understand is that the distribution of these things varies. For example, the touch receptor is very predominant around the neck region, the armpit, the genitals, and the likes. So, but of course, all of the part of the skin has all of this. So we have sensory receptors on our skin, all right? Then we have nerve fibers. Now, these are sensory neurons. I say sensory and motor neurons. Now, these sensory neurons are the ones that takes, once the touch receptor, I felt this because there's a, touch receptor of my skin, then I felt it, I passed it because there's a receptor, there's a sensory neuron connected to that sensory receptor that takes it to the spinal cord, to the brain. That's why I could perceive what I am doing, all right? So the skin also has nerves, which are made up of sensory and motor neurons. Now, we have sweat glands. Now, sweat glands are coiled, you can see that here. Yes, this is the sweat gland, they are coiled tubes or glands so to say the they help to carry out um, evaporation they have to regulate bo um, body temperature now distribution varies in animals now they are connected to they varies in the body of animals now they are connected to the to the, to the surface of the skin via sweat duct as you saw earlier on its content which is water and salt are brought by capillaries so this is what happens let me quickly show you that in a minute so you can see the sweat gland here you can see the capillary close to it so 
the sweat and the water in the capillary will get out, enter the sweat gland, then it will be released to the surface by what? Sweat ducts. Alright? That is in a way helping us to cool our body temperature. Now, the sweat gland are of two types. Now, the ones are found everywhere on the body, most we are called eccrine gland, alright? Or estrine. I don't know which of them to call, but it's eccrine gland, I pronounce it to be. But that's the correct spelling. What are the ones found at the armpit, around the nipples, region, pubic region, hands, and foot, and feet, and anus, are called apocrine. They secrete, the, the kind of water they secrete is more, and um, it's, it's, it's odorless. It's odorless. However, it can become very odoriferous when it is infected. That's why people tend to have bells on the armpit, pubic region, and the likes. So, the kind of sweat gland there is a bit different. The secretion is a bit different. All right. Then we also have sebaceous gland in the, in the dermis. They secrete oily liquid called sebum, which keeps the skin and the hair supple. So it's not only the skin alone, also the, the hair, supple and waterproof. So this, it means that sebaceous gland that secretes sebum or sebum plus keratin also help to keep the water waterproof. We said that earlier on for keratin. All right. Then it also, it also contains pigment cells. We have hair follicle. Now these are an folding of the epidermis. What part of the epidermis? The mapigian layer, like I showed you earlier on. And as it comes out, as air comes out from this, now this happens, air grows from the hair follicle, as it comes out from it, it becomes impregnated with keratin and melanin. So, the keratin makes it to, to become waterproof, the melanin gives it its color. So, depending on the kind of, how much of melanin you have, depends on how darker your hair will be, alright? But everybody has variably almost the same level of keratin, but melanin varies from race to race, alright? Basically. So now, let me quickly say at this point that the hair, when it's growing from the skin, originally it is white in color. But as it's growing out, the melanin coat it, then becomes black. That's why at old age, our hair tends to become whitish or gray because the level of melanin reduces with age. Alright? Now, we also have muscle fibers which this muscle fiber is called hair erector muscle or hair um um sorry erector pili muscle now this is a muscle that is connected to the base of the hair follicle now the contraction of this muscle changes the angle between the hair and the skin so this is the skin then this is the hair so when the muscle contracts it changes the angle i will show you an animation in a minute it changes the, the, the angle between when you contract, this is how it is normally. Once you contract, it causes the hair to increase its angle between the surface of the skin and the hair itself. Alright, and there's a, there's, it, it does something. I show you at the beginning how the hair stood up. You get to understand as we move on. So this helps. Um, let me, where did I stop reading? This is essential in regulation of, of temperature. When it contracts, the hair stands and traps air, which helps to insulate the skin in cold. That could also lead to goose pimples. So let me quickly explain some things I, I explained earlier on. I've talked about sweat gland, our sweat ducts. Then we have the, this is the hair follicle from which hair grows. As hair is growing, um, melanin from this layer of the skin is added to it, all right? Then this is the erector pili muscle or erector, hair erector muscle that will contract the hair follicle that will cause the hair to stand, all right? Then we have the oily gland, that's sebaceous gland, that secretes sebum. Alright, then let's move on. Then, now, I've shown you all of this, then you understand some of this in this subtopic. How does the body manages cold and heat? Now, look at this person here. Very cold. After some time, he should get some warmth by getting clothes. You can see these people down here. The early, it's, very, it's winter, very cold. But looking up, you see the hair standing. That hair standing is the contraction of the hair erector, um, erector muscles or topilar muscle. As a contract, you can see the hair standing. The aim of that is to trap hair, sorry, to trap hair, A I R, within the hair, which is H A I R. Now, what happens is that once it traps that, the heat loss by radiation is reduced. That's the aim. It is a, a coping mechanism during cold um, um, weather. So let's look at the sequence of that. 
Now, temperature is regulated by the skin. Now, the temperature in the body is regulated uh, by balancing the heat gain and the heat loss. Now, heat gain, heat is gain by stimulating the heat gain center in the hypothalamus and inhibiting the heat loss center of the hypothalamus. Now, this is achieved by the following activities. Now, like I just showed you, now, that guy is feeling cold, so he's trying to gain heat. So what happens is that the body will inhibit the part that will lose heat, but stimulate the part that what, will gain heat, because you're trying to gain heat. So what will happen is that there will be increase in basal metabolic rate, there will be voluntary contraction of the muscles, of course, the involuntary contraction of the muscles like shivering, like we saw that guy shivering. That shivering will create heat. The presence of some hormones such as adrenaline thyroxine will cause muscle activities to increase. The vasoconstriction, which means that the blood vessel capillaries will constrict and move away from the what? From the um, sweat gland. Once it doesn't touch the sweat gland, sweat water will not be released into it, so they will not be sweating. Then there's increase, there's inhibition of sweating and panting. We don't need to sweat because sweating releases temperature, releases heat. I was trying to conserve heat, so there won't be sweating, there won't be panting. Panting is seen in organisms such as um, um, uh, uh, um, dogs. They don't sweat on their skin, they only sweat on their pores. And they, they sweat, they, 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 they pant, they release more water from their mouth. So during cold, they don't pant for those that do that. Humans will not sweat because we are trying to conserve heat. Then increase in the thickness layer of the air. That contraction I just showed you in a minute. How, how the skin contracted. How the sorry, erector pili muscle contracted. I think let me show you that once again. How the erector pili muscle contracted to trap air. Once it traps air, it's an insulation on the skin. Alright. Then the person takes conscious effort on rubbing the palm. People do that just to create heat. Then taking covering. Then sometimes people walk up and down. Some people take gin to help that. Those are different mechanisms. Those are conscious effort. So this is the cascade of different things that happen to gain heat in a cold weather. Then look at looking at this guy, see him sweating. Now he has he has a lot of heat, so he needs to get rid of excess heat. So you can see the sweat gland here secreting its fluid sweat sweat and that's in a way reducing temperature by evaporation so let's see the sequence to that so it is lost by inhibiting the heat gain center because we already have heat so we want to inhibit the heat gain center and stimulating the heat loss center which is cold center so we are stimulating we want to get rid of excess heat i want we don't want to make more heat that's what we do. So this is achieved by the following activities. Decrease in basal metabolic rate. Digestion will reduce. Like we had before, digestion will increase. Now lesser activities, voluntary and involuntary activities of the muscle will reduce. There's no shivering. You won't be doing all of this. The vasodilation of the capillary lead to heat loss. Now, um, the capillary will get enlarged, get, will touch the sweat gland, then it will release its fluid, which is sweat, with the fluid into the sweat gland, the sweat gland will release the heat by what? Evaporation. Then also, it will, this vasodilation will cause radiation of heat. Heat loss by radiation, convection as a breeze is blowing on the skin, then conduction based on the things we touch. Maybe we sitting on a stool, sitting on something. That will transfer some little amount of heat. But evaporation of heat is really, really um, the one taking place. Yeah, so there's increased sweating. And panting for the animals that pant, then increase in contraction of of the uh, decrease. Oh, sorry, this point is not meant to be there. The, this will not happen. There will be relaxation of the hair of the of this erector pilamus. It will relax. It will not contract. Please pay take note of this. Take note of this. Please take note of this. There will be decrease contraction of the. There will be relaxation. Not contraction. This 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 is wrong. It's supposed to be relaxation of the hair top muscle. So the hair will not start to lie flat, so that air can blow. All right. Of course, if you just the previous slide, what I do was that I copy the previous slide and put this here. Then I edited it. I think I forgot to edit this one. What because what is happening here is just opposite of what happened there. 
Then also, there will be conscious activities such as getting fresh air, like that was blowing himself, moving from a sunny area to a shady area. The relaxation of, oh, beautiful, I wrote it here. Relaxation of the erector pillar muscle. So I ought to have removed this one totally. So those will be the changes that will happen. Then let's look at it diagrammatically. This is a summary of what I've been explaining this morning. So this is a normal temperature. So this is normal temperature here. So when there's decrease in temperature of the skin, Simulation of heat gain center, which is the posterior part of the hypothalamus. So we are trying to gain heat. So you increase in spontaneous activity, shivering, of course, increase in adrenaline secretion and metabolic rate, uh, cutaneous vasodilate constriction, and um, decrease in sweating. This will lead to decrease in heat loss, increase in heat production. So what we are trying to do is that when, when there is um, decrease in body um, temperature, we are trying to decrease heat loss or that will increase heat production so this is all of this one is bring about decrease in heat loss increase in heat production then for when there's increase in the water temperature we are trying to get rid of you see no shivering i try to get rid of no more heat production i wanted to increase heat loss so of course the video here is very simple so that will be all for now i believe you've been able to learn one or two things thank you very much for being with me